because they, not because they like it, but uh, because they make themselves targets for immune response, an immune system quite effectively eliminates them. However, with time, uh, immune system stops being effective and immune senescence develops. There is no more effective uh, clearance of these cells and which creates this, what they name longevity cliff when the, there is a progressive inflammation increases and death becomes unavoidable. So the key question in this picture is what is the endogenous DNA damage generator? So um, if the, and, and this one, if we discover it, potentially can become the timer of longevity. So its properties, we already know, but we now the question is what it is. The property is that it uh, should be genetically determined. It should not depend on cell divisions because most of our uh, cells are in uh, quiescent state. Uh, it should be somehow associated with in, in the induction of inflammation. And uh, most likely it will be critical for both anti-aging and anti-cancer research because um, uh, DNA damage and the huge variability of cancer cells depend on a very high degree of genomic instability, potentially meaning that this timer starts working faster in, 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 in tumors and actually DNA methylation clocks tells us that. So uh, for, for a long time, it was not clear what it could be, but I think today we have a very nice candidate for this role. There is a, uh, several uh, papers uh, in two of which we happen to be contributors, uh, uh, which were, I think, founding papers to, to link the accumulation of cells with uh, uh, inflamed phenotype and damaged DNA with certain part of our genome, which is occupied by uh, endogenous retro elements. I'm not talking much about endogenous retroviruses that are quite, uh, quite low in numbers. I mean those uh, ancient elements which are uh, represented by uh, signs and lines and all which all together uh, occupy about half of our DNA. Uh, so I will talk about them down the road today. And these papers demonstrate that, uh, in, that loss of P53 or senescence uh, uh, when uh, associated with uh, uh, either uh, increased uh, frequency of cancer or inflammation, both associated with increased activity of retro elements, which is translated into inflammation through activation of C-gas sting pathway and interferon and f kappa b function. So um, let's talk about retrobiome because I think the half of genome deserves the term. So we, we, you have term microbiome, why not to have term retrobiome because it's half of our DNA. Uh, so this is some statistics. So uh, I will be talking predominantly about sign and line elements, which are interspersed among the genes, um, occupying nearly <clears throat> about 40% of human DNA. And the reason they name the retro elements is because their replication, if they're allowed to replicate, goes through the process of reverse transcription. So um, they appeared in our DNA uh, as multiple explosions, uh, evolu happened in our evolutions, and every explosion was associated most likely with a huge explosion of genetic diversity and uh, potentially genetic catastrophes followed by periods of, of uh, quiet uh, periods when the amplification did not occur. So let's look at that in more precise way. How does this work? So you see here two major classes of genes, uh, which are transcribed by RNA polymerase two and RNA polymerase three. RNA polymerase two is a polymerase which transcribes uh, RNA um, from genes encoding proteins, RNA polymerase three, uh, is uh, used for uh, synthesis of uh, service RNAs, such as tRNA, 7SL RNAs, etc. So uh, this is the normal flow of genetic information uh, in the result of which, uh, both of which you start from DNA and then end up with a, either protein or functional RNA. However, there, are, uh, there is a virus-like element named line one, which looks like normal gene with one exception that it has promoter, which is not outside of the transcribed region, but inside, named line one. And this line one encodes reverse transcriptase. We have half million copies of line one in our DNA, vast majority of which are killed by mutations and, and stay there as archaeological remains, but uh, <clears throat> about 150 of them are still intact. And if allowed, can generate reverse transcriptase and start this process of self-replication 
when they make cDNA copy of its own RNA and integrate it back, creating the daughter copy. That's the way of replication of this retro element. Everything would be nice and good because they are extremely slow. This process is very well controlled. Most of these elements are under very severe epigenetic repression. But unfortunately, this reverse transcriptase is quite promiscuous. And it sometimes makes copies of um, mRNAs of normal genes, uh, of product mRNAs, creating so-called pseudogens. They are pseudogens because they're non-functional. They are, do not have not only introns, but they have no promoters, of course. So these are promoterless, intronless copies of genes. Again, this process is not dangerous because it just generates the bulk of uh, junk in our DNA. By the way, we have several thousands of copies of, uh, of this um, process pseudogens, which occupy quite a big proportion of our DNA, but although they are completely silent. But, so, but the real problem appeared when this reverse transcriptase starts making copies of this small RNAs, which are transcribed by RNA polymerase three. The pivotal difference between the way how Pol2 and Pol3 act is that Pol3 has promoters which are inside transcribed region, which means that cDNA copy of tRNA or 7SL RNA are technically functional. So, which means that in the presence of reverse transcriptase, they turn into primitive viruses because every new copy of them creates uh, RNA, which can be then transcribed, uh, reverse transcribed back and create a new copy. The moment it happens, the polymerase chain reaction starts. And with polymerase chain reaction, we start evolution because those RNAs which acquire mutations, making them very attractive for the reverse transcriptase, they start uh, amplifying. This is the way how sign elements appeared in our DNA. Uh, ALU sequences is the progeny of mutated 7SL RNA, and they are competing for reverse transcriptase attention with line one. So they are parasites on viruses, which simply evolved to become effective for polymerase chain reaction in the presence of reverse transcriptase. So, uh, this trouble, this creates a trouble, of course, uh, not only in evolution, but in somatic cells that we will see. This trouble become even worse because this reverse transcriptase have has endonuclease activity and can make holes in DNA. All these terrible events would be detrimental to our health and life if they would not be very severely controlled, uh, because obviously in evolution, we acquired numerous mechanisms to keep all this uh, all these things silent. So they are transcriptionally silent due to the uh, DNA methylation and being uh, in methylated and deacetylated parts of uh, chromatin, uh, being controlled by certain 6 p53 RB. So all these genes are involved in the epigenetic silencing. Even when they are deregulated and become uh, awake, they still, the RNA still can be killed by mechanisms like PV or uh, APOBEC. And even if that does not work, the cell feels the presence of reverse transcription products in the cytoplasm and activate interferon signaling, which would kill such cells. Nevertheless, regardless of all these precautions, sometimes, uh, because we have trillions of cells, there are cells which can overcome all these obstacles and uh, stay alive and become the source of inflammation. And uh, moreover, this process can occur in evolution because we see a gradual increase in the number of reactor elements during the evolutionary uh, stairs. So let's speak, a few, let's say a few words about the main troublemaker, line one element. Line one element is 6KB long element, which encodes only two proteins named ORF1 and ORF2, ORF2 of which is reverse transcriptase. Uh, uh, at the N terminus, it has endonuclease, plays the role of integrase, and the rest is polymerase. So the moment it gets activated, this is a big trouble because the cell, if it is not killed, it creates uh, uh, DNA breaks because the nuclease constantly makes holes in DNA. It creates insertions of its own uh, line one elements as well as the side elements around it. It makes pseudogens. Uh, the new integrations create uh, hotspots for recombination, uh, promoting amplifications and deletions, and all this together induces Siga sting pathway, uh, which drives interferon and the nf kappa b response, thereby making source, becoming the source of genomic instability and inflammation, suspiciously resembling those whom we suspected as a timer of longevity. 
So if we think about this trio, we see that retrobiome very nicely satisfies all these conditions. It's uh, retrobiome is now genes, so it, the, whatever it does is genetically determined. It can cause DNA damage in somatic cells, not divide, de depending on cell divisions, and it can cause chronic systemic inflammation. So let's speak a little bit about evolution. How, uh, how did we acquire all this uh, retrobiome? It's actually a very interesting question. Line one elements are so ancient that we cannot really find their, their origin. They are all over the, the world of eukaryotes, uh, including insects, for example. But appearance of sign elements, we can track down quite well. So uh, about 100 million years ago, there was no zoo in our current understanding of the zoo of mammals. At that time, zoo of mammals would be extremely boring because there were about, we know from paleontological evidence that there were several dozens of species of mammals and they all looked quite, uh, quite boring way. So however, then in a relatively short evolutionary time, all major archetypes of mammals which created the diversity which we enjoy in the zoo happen. Uh, and it coincided with the uh, extinction of dinosaurs and massive changes of life on this planet. After that, there was a long period of multiple dozens of um, millions of years when there were no any major changes in archetypes. There was a typical Darwin's evolution when within the orders of mammals, there were adaptation differences such as hamster difference from mouse, mouse from rat, whale from dolphin, uh, and so on. But there were no major in creations in evolution. And when we look what happened at that period of time in our genome, genomes by comparing currently uh, present um, mammals, we'll find that this is exactly the time when all major families of sign elements appeared. Today, sign elements are order specific. There are sign elements, all primates have one type of sign elements. All rodents have has another. Uh, uh, all uh, elephants have, uh, you know, uh, the third one, all uh, marsupials, third one, and, and so on and so forth. So, which means that most likely uh, what happened is that uh, in uh, at that period of time, there was a massive genetic catastrophes associated with massive amplification of uh, de novo appearing sign elements, which created a large number of malformations from which in, uh, natural selection selected uh, the archetypes, which then found some niches where they could survive. And now they will live till today. So the hypothesis, which we're trying to <clears throat> prove now, uh, is uh, which we are inspired with, is that by acquiring this uh, mm, entries in our genome, we simultaneously acquired the timer of life. Because depending on the way how well these elements are epigenetically repressed, we uh, can have the time during which we can live, and uh, those who have them more active has less time to live because their accumulation of cells with activated lines or signs would be shorter. So this is our main hypothesis that every species has its own personal generator of DNA damage. This DNA damage is encoded in our genes, and uh, our, we live under the uh, hypothesis that retrobiome is that mysterious timer of life which we are looking for. So let's now talk whether uh, we have any data to support this. Well, uh, first, uh, the question is how confident could we, we could be with this reconstruction of evolution and appearance of this uh, archetype, morphological archetype, which divided orders of mammals. And uh, there is a, a fantastic example showing that this is mostly likely true. And this example comes from our own, uh, not natural selection, but our own selection driven by humans. And this is the natural history of dogs. So if you think about dogs, uh, uh, the first thing which comes to mind is that this is the most diverged in terms of uh, differences in morphology within one species of mammals. Nothing like that uh, exists in any other domesticated or wild animals. So we created so many uh, forms of dogs that it's hard to imagine that, uh, that they, they all belong to the same species. So clearly, uh, it means that something is very special in the genome of dogs allowing this plasticity. And when we ask the question, what are the major genetic drivers of morphological changes in dogs which determine interbreed differences, 
And we can do it because for some of these uh, for traits, these um, genetic events have been identified simply by genetic mapping and sequencing. And it appears that in every case, we know the reason. And we know this reason, for example, for the mutation which uh, is causing short legs of corgi, dachshund, um, and or we know the same for a short uh, flat nose of boxer and so on. And every time it's a retro element sitting in a new place. So this means that retro elements of dogs are very fun, uh, very uh, active and they create, uh, they jump in the genome and they modulate activity of the genes creating mutations which are sometimes translated to morphological malformations, which we happily pick and make from them malformed dogs and breed and now start enjoying it as if it is was done by nature. So, um, and, um, oops, for some reason my, Yep. So the next question is, so uh, the dogs give us already, so that my, our first now uh, mentioning dogs in this talk, there will be plenty more down the road, but they already give us very strong inspiration and strong foundation for um, illustrating that our understanding of evolution of retro elements and their role in creation of diversity is made most likely right. The next thing we would like to do is to check obvious prediction. If indeed the activity of retro elements is a driver of longevity, then those species which are known to be exceptionally long living may have something different in terms of activity of retro elements. How can you study that? And of course, here we wanted to focus on the legendary naked molarets, the rodents which live uh, uh, at least 10 times longer than uh, mice or rats, uh, and uh, whose genome was recently uh, well enough sequenced for the, uh, to make retrospective analysis of the evolutionary dynamic of occurrence of uh, retro elements in them. We to, this unpublished work, which uh, we recently finished, was focused on the analysis of processed pseudogens, cDNA copies of mRNA, which I recently described. And uh, the reason we focused on them because they are much less abundant than line and sign elements themselves. They are counted in thousands, while those are millions. And um, therefore, they're pretty easy to uh, identify, distinguish, and analyze. And here we were based on a very simple, so first of all, we made the technology named PPG Finder. And there are actually only two technologies, bioinformatic technologies for um, systematic, systematic finding of uh, pseudogens. One is older one named Pseudopipe. The other one is uh, younger named PPG Finder, which we did. It is based on finding uh, exon exon junction in the genome. Obviously, if exon exon junction in the genome appear, it means that they are resulting from reverse transcription. So uh, both uh, both methods give a very nice coincidence. So this is the number of pseudogens identified by either of them in mouse genome. You see, they are practically identical. So the idea we pursued in this work was the following: <clears throat> If pseudogen appeared many millions of years ago. Uh, uh, it be became the subject for neutral evolution and start acquiring uh, mutations um, uh, passively. And uh, the older the pseudogen, the more mutations it's acquired. So which means that if we find all pseudogens in given organism, uh, like on the right bottom part, and then classify them into those which are either close or far from their own mRNA in terms of mutations, we can separate them into their uh, kind of their evolutionary age. And by looking how abundant these pseudogens uh, of different diversity from known mRNA, we have a time machine allowing us to see how effective was generation of pseudogens at given times of evolution. So we started from analyzing these organisms. You know, we know very well how these rodents uh, diverged. So uh, mice and rat uh, bifurcated about 10 million years ago. And naked mole rat, uh, it was a very ancient event. It was more than 40 million years ago. So, and uh, the idea is that mouse and rat should have plenty of common pseudogens, which were integrated in the genome of their common predecessor, while naked mole rat should have none. And also, if uh, th those uh, pseudogens which are common in between mouse and rat should be pretty far away from their own mRNA, while those which are unique should be closed. We checked that pr property and it appeared exactly true. So uh, this is the histograms showing the uh, frequency of 
uh, pseudogens uh, which with certain degree of homology without mRNA, you see this in the bottom is a percent of homology. And while unique mouse and red pseudogens, plenty of them have 100% homology, those which are in common have none. So they're all ancient. So it works really well. This is the, the proof that our approach works. And then we looked what happens in naked mole red. And here comes a shocking result. So first of all, it appears on the left, you see what happened in the mouse. You see that looking back in about 20 million years, we see that the process of creation of pseudogens was working with more or less the same speed and only was increased in numbers recently, most likely because we are dealing with inbred mice and uh, they uh, potentially have less effective suppression of retrotranspositions. While the naked mole rat has, naked mole rat has none pseudogens, which would be identical to their own mRNAs. However, they passed in evolution about 10 million years ago through the period when the process of generating a new pseudogen worked enormously effective, incomparably higher than in mice. So all this together, and then we looked at the same thing in different species of animals. You see humans and other rodents, you see that naked mole is quite unique because all others do have pseudogens of recent acquisition. And this is re evolutionary reconstruction. We go from right to left, that at some point of evolution, common predecessor of naked mole rats happened to acquire um, very actively multiplying, a uh, very active process of reverse transcription and retrobiome activity, which created lots of malformations. Majority of animals died and those who survived, they happened to somehow stop this process and since then enjoy life having no activity of retro elements, which somehow coincided with the exceptional longevity. Not proving, but definitely providing a nice illustration. So next question is, does retrobiome get expanded during lifetime? Because if our, our hypothesis is right, then of course we would expect that with time, the number of retro elements in our somatic cells should be bigger. It is not a trivial question to address because our somatic tissues are mosaic. And if in every cell these new elements appear, uh, you cannot really do, you know, see it by whole genome sequencing in an easy way uh, because you, have, you are sequencing a mixture of multiple cells. So we chose to work with dogs uh, because we uh, became um, very inspired with the fact that dogs have active retrobiome. And we uh, enjoyed collaboration with uh, uh, Cornell um, University uh, Bank of, of uh, Labrador, uh, Bank of uh, Tissue Bank. And we had DNA from uh, the same dog isolated several times during a dog's life with uh, several years of intervals. And the hope was that when we do deep sequencing of this uh, DNA, uh, we may uh, start seeing traces of events of uh, integration of a different uh, of elements into different sites. Well, again, this is how it looks in, um, in the uh, schematic way. So every chromosome has numerous sites of germline integrations of sign or line elements. Then in during uh, tissue, aging in somatic cells, you have somatic expansion, which some, in some cells may be high and some cells may be lower. And then when you do sequencing and you analyze sequencing for the reads which span through the um, chimeric uh, areas when the newly integrated element appears to be, uh, you know, uh, prolong appears to be um, connected with a site of integration. So, of course, you cannot find every single event because it's mosaic thing. But if this, uh, this process goes far along, we may see multiple single reads, which would give you the uh, reflection of uh, how frequent this process occurs in population. This approach appears to work. Uh, we were preparing a uh, manuscript to describe this in more detail. <clears throat> and uh, we used the, uh, the blood, uh, the blood of uh, Labrador's taken with several years interval. And we were able by analyzing blood taken a three years old dog and nine years old dog to classify all the entries of retro elements, which we see there in those which are germline, may mar marked as GL here, and those which appeared as a somatic expansion. Uh, distinguishing them by uh, two ways. One way is obviously a reduction in the coverage uh, and second uh, deviation from the uh, reference genome. 
So all this together brought us to the results when we were able to trace the um, number of copies of somatic integrations of retro elements belonging to different subclasses because we can distinguish them by characteristic mutations. And you see that some subclasses uh, appeared to be amplified during aging in somatic tissues. And in both dogs, we see uh, in both two, we analyze two dogs. You see that in both dogs, we see pretty much the same elements increasing in numbers. So all this brought us to the conclusion that with age indeed in somatic cells, at least in the blood, we see the increase in the number of new entries of, uh, we did it with side elements. And uh, uh, this, pro but we also had a, took advantage of having several dogs with tumors. We were able to do similar work when we compared what is happening in tumors versus normal tissues. And we found that in tumors, this process goes well, but with much higher speed. But I want to remind you that tumors frequently acquire hallmarks of aging in terms of methylation clock faster than normal tissues, again, uh, giving a nice correlation with our theory. What is very important is that uh, the same process is happening in humans. And by studying dogs, we in principle believe that we are studying what is happening in tumors as well, because today we know that <clears throat> vast majority of human tumors have desilenced de retrobiome. They have become positive for line one antigens. And um, uh, at least in human cancer, there is a progressive increase in the expansion of retrobiome. So all this gives us very nice additional uh, inspiration for and uh, support for our, uh, view, for our views. And the natural question would be, is there a way to translate what we learned into something real? Can we do something besides synalytic compounds, which most likely uh, will not be a panacea. So yes, uh, looking at this picture, if it is right, uh, there are, it gives us the um, uh, answers what can be done. One thing is to attempt to stop retrobiome, to help organism to keep this poisonous content in check and not allowing it to be uh, functional. The second thing is to uh, work on the immune system and to restore immune function to improve ability of immune system to recognize the inflamed cells and eliminate them. So let's see what we can do. Uh, today's talk, I will not be able to talk about the right part, although we are working on that too. And we are focusing only on the left part. <clears throat> Here we're quite fortunate because remember all these retro elements, they completely depend on one process named reverse transcription <laughs> and on the other process named integration. So they depend on two, pro on two enzymatic reactions on polymerase, reverse transcriptase, and on endonuclease. And although we do not have today endonuclease inhibitors, but we do have plenty of reverse transcriptase inhibitors because we generate, we as humanity generated them to treat HIV, <clears throat> to treat hepatitis B virus. And some of these inhibitors are non-specific enough to be quite effective against line one reverse transcriptase. So, uh, uh, in frames of this paradigm is written here, we can consider aging as an inherited viral disease and treat it as a viral infection. And uh, these days, everybody in the world has become virologists, so it's very easy to explain. So uh, we started this work by testing whether we can um, get any phenotype associated with aging using reverse transcriptase inhibitors specific, uh, select, which can inhibit line one. And this is uh, the uh, picture from our recently published work done in collaboration with Vera Gorbunova's group in the University of Rochester, in which uh, mice were used, which uh, are, have an extremely short life uh, because they have derepressed retrobiome um, and uh, they live in constant inflammation and constant DNA damage because of that. Uh, they have certain six knockout. Use of reverse transcriptase, in, transcriptase inhibitors in these mice does two things. It reduces dramatically the degree of inflammation in them and prolongs their life, not rescuing it there, but prolongs it long enough to be detectable. We can't rescue them because we cannot inhibit and the nuclease, they still have DNA damage. But very important take home message from this work is reverse transcriptase inhibitors can work against line one. Then uh, what we uh, started uh, looking, we started looking whether, uh, whether reverse transcriptase inhibitors can work in the model of aging. 
uh, we used our own domestic model of accelerated aging when we showed that when we take mice <clears throat> and we, instead of waiting three years before they all die from aging, we found that combination of uh, radiation with high fat diet causes dramatic acceleration of frailty and death, which may or may not be premature aging, but we use it as such. And we show that in this system, when we use reverse transcriptase inhibitor, we practically um, uh, will revert this, this effect and prolong this life of mice quite substantially. So we have the proofs that reverse transcriptase inhibitors in the uh, model of premature aging may have, uh, may have activity. Well, remember that line one elements and their activity is uh, very plays important role in cancer. Most cancers are line one positive. And this means that these cancers potentially can benefit uh, or suffer depending what uh, we think from um, reverse transcriptase activity. So we wanted to see uh, what reverse transcriptase inhibitors would do in terms of cancer ability, to, uh, ability of cancer to evolve, cancer evolution. And what we found, and this is the model in which we did this work, again, this is unpublished data, but manuscript has been just prepared, that uh, this is the model of mice, which you I'm sure very well know. Uh, they um, develop 100% females develop breast cancer because of her to new Mm, her to new uh, transgene uh, under um, uh, memory gland specific promoter, and all females die within a year and a half of age from breast cancer. This is a very good model for chemotherapy because if you use HSP90 inhibitor, DMAG, you can significantly prolong this life of these mice, as you see on the red curve, but then unavoidably 100% of mice develop secondary tumors, uh, relapsed, and die. Well, when we combine treatment of these mice with inhibitor of reverse transcriptase stevudine, it we found that it has no effect on the occurrence of tumors whatsoever and is, does not have any anti-tumor activity by itself. However, when it is combined with chemotherapy, it appears that it dramatically extends progression-free survival, blocking tumor ability to acquire drug resistance. This uh, was, the effect is, extremely reproducible, very strong, and reproduced also in other mouse models, indicating that for the first time in oncology, we may have the drug which does not have inhibitory activity to tumor cells themselves, but which inhibits cancer creativity. So, uh, and the reverse transcriptase inhibitor is, the, is that drug. Based on this result, we uh, recently started a clinical trial here at Roswell, uh, between Roswell and uh, sponsored by the uh, company which we started and uh, in, which I mentioned in the beginning named Genome Protection, in which people with uh, small cell lung cancer uh, receiving on top of standard of care, they receive uh, lamivudine, the reverse transcriptase inhibitor with hope that that will prolong their progression free survival. But now I'm coming to the most kind of uh, exciting to us part of this talk, and about the idea how to um, use everything we, we learned and accumulated to the world of dogs. And you already, uh, I already tried to explain why dogs have become our central <clears throat> center of our research interest. Uh, that, uh, well, uh, for obvious reasons, they would be research interest not only connected with retrobiome because dogs are part of us, they're part of community. They're a great model of human aging. They have uh, frailty. Mm, uh, the, uh, there is a big uh, economic, uh, emotional, and healthy uh, need to uh, health need to extend dog's life. All this is obvious. But what is also very important is that dog, dogs have uh, enormously active uh, retrobiome and potentially can be a good target for the approaches we're trying to develop. So, uh, uh, the um, thinking about that, uh, we uh, teamed up with uh, a faculty of Cornell University School of Veterinary, uh, which is one of the most of the best in the in, in the country, um, and uh, we work with uh, uh, several uh, several faculty members there. And uh, Joe Wachschlag, uh, who is one of them, came up with a brilliant idea instead of doing the work on. Uh, on the uh, household dogs, which are enormously diverged in terms of lifestyle, genetics, uh, habits of their owners, 
um, and so on, um, to focus on retired sled dogs, which are on one hand uh, are not confounded by be belonging to a very narrow genetic niche, like uh, studies of uh, Labradors or something like that. Or, on the other hand, had a similar lifestyle and um, could be collected in one facility under universal conditions of uh, housing, uh, diet, and uh, so on, and uh, observed till the end of their life in order to collect information for both the uh, trajectory of their uh, decline and the studying what a dog aging is, and second, to uh, analyze their genetics, looking at their somatic uh, cell events, which are happening in them, and most importantly, apply anti-aging, uh, excuse me, uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitory treatments as potential anti-aging approach. So to do that, we established the uh, organization which you can look at this website uh, named VICA, uh, which uh, is located in the, uh, uh, the campus of Cornell University near Baker Institute, occupies this building, uh, and uh, which houses, uh, initially housed 103 retired sled dogs, uh, eight years and elder, which were collected from multiple kennels from North America and Alaska and brought into this facility. So uh, this uh, is the uh, facility itself. So it's the whole building, which you know, keeps in a very comfortable way uh, uh, dogs with uh, the uh, rooms of uh, allowing, doing multiple measurements, including uh, assessment of their physical fitness. Their cognitive, we're applying cognitive tests. Uh, we are uh, measuring uh, all possible immunological parameters we could, could measure uh, with on live animals. Uh, and uh, uh, but pretty much trying to understand what these dogs do uh, uh, in terms of accumulation of aging from uh, tip of toe, nose to tip of the tail. And this, you can read about this in the, uh, this recently published uh, paper. And this is the picture from this paper demonstrating that uh, our, uh, our aging uh, views on our aging as a systemic process driven by accumulation cells with active retrobiome and highlighting what kind of parameters we are measuring. So uh, we, uh, all this uh, together, uh, and currently this, uh, this program is already three and a half years old. So uh, we, uh, dogs are getting elder. <clears throat> we are collecting all possible sampling from them. Uh, we are generating some of the data which I mentioned in the talk, including data on uh, dogs' tumors were generated already using this uh, DNA from these dogs. And we are learning a lot from that. And uh, in a reasonable time, we already will have the results, conclusive results from the ongoing study because these dogs were randomized into two groups, one which, which received placebo and the other one received in a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And uh, it's, we soon will reach the time when we'll summarize all these parameters and we'll, we'll be able to come up with an uh, answer whether we reached or did not reach any success with this type of treatment. And we are also to preparing to try other types of treatment of these dogs along, the, mm, and along this plan which we had initially. Because this is the summary of how we see aging, uh, both uh, for humans and dogs, that aging is indeed associated with accumulation of cells with damaged DNA uh, uh, and which are, while we are young, uh, effectively cleared from with the immune system. While immunosenescence develops, this process gets impaired and uh, we have gradual accumulation of that leading to frailty, chronic inflammation, acquisition of, um, acquisition of age-related diseases and death. And our approach to uh, overcome that is actually threefold. We're using, as I highlighted today, the talk mostly is using reverse transcriptase inhibitors. As you may understand, I already mentioned that, that we need in principle to suppress two activities of line one, which is reverse transcriptase and the nuclease. We're also working on making endonuclease inhibitors. We are focused on creating immunological approaches to stimulate eliminating cells with active retrobiome through vaccination. And we're also working on reverting immunosenescence, something which I, uh, we did a very long way to, but I don't have time to describe, describe it today. And all these things is done in two organizations, 
both of which we started and run uh, with, with, with Katia. And this is uh, Genome Protection and VICA. And I want, I forgot to mention that uh, the uh, road page uh, is the chairman of board of directors of VICA. So it's our uh, collaborative uh, activity. So all this effort <clears throat> brought, has brought us already to uh, three main uh, kind of directions. One, two of which are already in uh, testing. Uh, the clinical trial with Lumivudin I have already mentioned. Clinical trial with, um, with uh, uh, yeah, clinical trial with, um, uh, on, with Invica, I will also explain, but also <clears throat> genome protection, which is shown here with the wrong uh, uh, website uh, link, um, uh, is developing uh, specific inhibitors for reverse transcriptase of line one and endonuclease. So I will probably finish here by showing the um, list of uh, people who are involved in this work. As I said, we are uh, here. Um, it's an integrated effort of three organizations with lots of uh, collaborators. Uh, and uh, you see their names here. And I probably will stop here to uh, take your questions. Uh, and this is, I will finish this picture, which I like very much. It's an ancient picture from Lucas Cranach, the elder, very well known in, for everybody who is studying aging, which shows very picturesquely how people get rejuvenated in Fountain of Youth. And uh, our uh, joke, internal joke, which we take very seriously, is that this Fountain of Youth, this water contains inhibitors of line one reverse transcriptase and the nuclease and immunotherapy against cells with active retrobiotic. All right, so this, I will stop here, stop sharing, and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll, we'll be ready to address your questions. Rod, did you want to start off or can I start off? Why don't you go ahead and start, James? Yes. I've got a number of questions and I'm probably going to scoop Edward because he's probably coming up with the same ones. <laughs> so, so first off, I, I, I think you, you, first off, fantastic talk. That's really exciting stuff, but when you're using these RT inhibitors in, in the mouse models, I think you only used them on premature aging. Have you tried it on natural aging cohorts and maybe even starting, you know, when they're 12 months old? You may not need to start when they're, you know, newborns. Uh, I'm not sure we ever did comprehensive experiment on that way. We, um, we did uh, shorter term treatments collecting DNA to look at the amplification of repeats, which is is being in an, in an in analysis, but we did not do not have the data for the real longevity. Yeah, because what I'm really curious about is, you know, particularly if you compare across like dog breeds or across closely related species with different lifespans, if you're, you know, if the real difference in in reactivation of these elements isn't so much in whether they get reactivated, but when they get reactivated, you know. So in other words, is, this, is, is the maintenance of youth associated with suppression of this activity? And if that maintenance, you know, is essentially through natural reproductive lifespans, you know, for humans, that would be till we're 40 or 50, you know, when we are likely to have reproduced for most of our evolutionary history. For a mouse, that might be a year. Yeah, it's an excellent, excellent point. Uh, it's very well <clears throat> coincides with our direction of thinking. However, need to remember that we are dealing here with two processes. One process is uh, the silencing and reactivation of the expansion, which most likely may not necessarily be under control of, <clears throat> uh, may, may the change, changes dynamic dramatically. I think what really makes uh, changes dramatically is the uh, occurrence of immunosenescence and the reduction of the process of their elimination of cells with active retrobiome. Mm -hmm. Whether immunosenescence and its onset is associated with the process of expansion of retro elements, it's a big question. It's a very attractive hypothesis because you know that with aging of hematopoietic system, you see quite massive epigenetic reprogramming. And remember that uh, retrotransposition of these elements, they change the epigenetic landscape because each of them are magnets for epigenetic silence. So this is very possible, but it's definitely pretty far away from conclusive uh, proofs. All right, I have more, but I'm gonna stop for now and I'll come back after everyone else asks theirs. 
Any other questions? A question too. Yeah, go ahead, Edward. Andre. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, thanks, Tanya. <laughs> Such yeah. a beautiful talk. Oh my goodness, I learned so much. <clears throat> so tell me. Uh, so I, I'm really, uh, you, you know, I'm so far away from uh, uh, cell biology or animals uh, or biology in general. So what I read while you were talking uh, uh, on Wikipedia, lines are transcribed into mRNA and translated into protein that uh, acts as a, a reverse transcriptase. So are they all um, enzymes, lines? No, line is a genetic element. So they initially, when they appeared, they all originated from the process of reverse transcription. So indeed, all lines uh, encode reverse transcriptase technically. However, <clears throat> since many of these lines appeared millions of years ago, they acquired lots of point mutations, truncations. Therefore, vast majority of this uh, repeats in our genome, although initially they did encode reverse transcriptase. Today cannot encode anything because they are killed by mutations. Out of hundred, half million copies of lines in our genome, which all have homologies with genes of reverse transcriptase, only about 150 in human genome and only about 3000 in mouse genome are still capable of encoding reverse transcriptase being intact. All right. Now, and, uh, um, another question, what structural biologists uh, could do for you? <laughs> they actually do already something. Because All right. Uh, we recently, you may look at that, we recently published a paper, uh, literally like a few months ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in, months ago. in nucleic acids research, uh, in which, uh, with the help of our collaborator in St. Louis University, Sergey Korolev, Korolev uh, who we uh, crystallized, he crystallized and resolved the structure of endonuclease of uh, reverse transcriptase of line one in complex with DNA, which actually uh, gave us a structural foundation for development of small molecules, which we have right now and which already, at least in vitro, quite effectively inhibit endonuclease. Right, right, yeah. Good, great. I will. Take a look, uh, Andre. Miss you so much. You know <laughs> our <laughs> chats about uh, 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 somatic uh, uh, deletion of uh, uh, well, somatic mass uh, uh, deletion uh, expand uh, uh, lifespan or something like this. Uh, um, yeah. So uh, visit us again. With pleasure. We'll be so happy to do that. So some of us like to do about his skiing too. Edward, before uh, before we have to call it off, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I really enjoy the talk. I also study transposons more on the epigenetic side, and I also have an aging dog, so I'm really rooting for Vika. And you know, sign me up if you're if you're open to trials. Um, so my question was, you know, I think the focus on using uh, reverse transcription inhibitors, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense for a human, right? Because that's the main active um, transposon that we have. And I was just um, I mean, you, you kind of alluded to this before, but, you know, the activities, the inflammatory activities of transposons could range from, you know, the actual reverse transcription and the nucleus activity of lines, but also, um, you know, double-stranded RNAs from endogenous retroviruses and signs, um, which, you know, you know, to my understanding, wouldn't be affected by those drugs. And I was just curious, your take on the relative contribution of, say, direct DNA damage versus, say, double-strand RNA and transposons. And then also I was wondering on your thoughts in dogs where there are active um, endogenous retroviruses as well, you know, maybe that could also contribute to their aging and whether um, there are other drugs or, or approaches to try to hit at that angle of retrobiome activity in addition to the ones you're targeting uh, right now. Thank you for the question. So <clears throat> um, you, are, you are right that uh, we cannot uh, make the world centric around line one only. However, line ones are positioned in such a way that they kind of um, look as the major driver of the process. Well, first of all, in terms of numbers, at least in human genome, the uh, line ones are much, much more abundant than a few uh, endogenous retroviruses like hervi K, hervi H, which by the way, cannot really amplify themselves in the genome because they cannot, in order to, <clears throat> for them to retrotranspose, they have to get out of the cell and reinfect it again. 
and they, they're not doing it that effectively. So here we are, with those retroviruses, we're mostly talking about for their phenotypic, the effects on phenotype through expression itself rather than through reverse transcription and uh, reintegration. The second thing is that <clears throat> the major uh, driver of uh, mutations are, of course, signs, because signs are so abundant, they're the most abundant repeats, like ALU, B1, B2, B3 in dogs, and C in, in excuse me, C1 in dogs, and B1, B2, B3 in rodents. And they are actually, uh, as we recently showed and still not published, that they can be um, driven by line one reverse transcriptase, even in the absence of line one, its own retrotransposition. So, um, and since they're much more abundant than anything, and their degree of the epigenetic repression is much less effective than for line one elements, uh, I think that they uh, may be most likely um, targets for our interests rather than other less suspicious and less, uh, 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 well, with, with less degree of risk uh, type of element, types of elements. Another thing is that those reverse transcriptase inhibitors which we are using, lamivudine, stevudine, tenofovir, they, believe it or not, also effective against reverse transcriptase of all other things which you mentioned. Uh, they are quite promiscuous. But the main problem with reverse transcriptase inhibitors is that you already know that, that inhibiting polymerase activity is absolutely insufficient to reach the goal because in the nuclease, which cannot be inhibited by either, either of them, is doing its job regardless and uh, activates DNA damage uh, and uh, uh, its inhibition is essential. That is why in our own plans, we are focusing on simultaneous targeting of both by developing drugs, which you know, ideally would cause degradation on ORF2 and through that, at least eliminate you know, line one driven problem. Andre. I have another question. So uh, that's, you are talking about NAR paper, yeah? Uh, nuclear so, research. You, yeah. yeah, okay, good. Yeah, I, I see the picture, beautiful. Um, I had another question, um, I forgot. Uh, um, oh, you, you are talking about um, um, uh, epigenetic uh, uh, aspects. Uh, do, have you have you found uh, uh, some major players uh, who are well, well well known epigenetic uh, elements uh, as far as proteins uh, what we normally talk about uh, or maybe you know DNA methylation? Well, there is plenty of argument, plenty of data around that. Uh, the, uh, all these elements, since we live with them for millions of years, uh, they are subjects for uh, effective epigenetic repression. Their promoters are heavily methylated and they are covered by heterochromatin. Uh, so, which means that <clears throat> whenever a new copy appears, it gets, uh, it gets epigenetically get repressed based on its sequence. Uh, and uh, that is actually the mechanism why expansion of these elements and the appearance of new copies may potentially have a more global effect on epigenome because every time when you have a, uh, an element integrated, which is a magnet for epigenetic repression, it can cause uh, epigenetic repression of surrounding uh, sequences as well. Uh, so uh, you don't, I think that uh, the connection between line ones um, as well as signs and uh, Mm, apparatus of epigenetic repression is really well proven. No, Clara has been trying to get a question in. If we could let her jump in. Thanks, James. I appreciate that. I don't like to interrupt. Uh, thank you so much for that talk. It was very, very interesting. Uh, and I apologize if you mentioned it and I and I kind of missed it. But could you comment on whether this hypomethylation of the line items um, is occurring at different rates in different tissues? Um, and if, if you've observed or looked at even, it, it, the question that comes to my mind when I ask this is that aging a, of tissues occurs at different rates, right? And often we look at older 
generations, but there are certain tissues that start aging much earlier. And the one I think of that happens both in humans and in dogs is that our hair turns white. Um, and that in humans at least starts in the early 30s, as I've noticed, because I'm in my early 30s and it's starting. Um, and so whether those melanocytes have any evidence of, um, of that hypomethylation that you're talking about or expansion of those transposons. So comprehensive answer to your question is that we don't know, but I will say several comments. So first, uh, you are saying as if it would be, mm, I would say, uh, intuitively obvious that tissues age with different speed. At emotional level, I tend to agree with you. But if we look, for example, at uh, the most re reliable biomarker of aging accepted today, which is DNA methylation clock, you will be surprised, but all tissues age at the same speed. So, and this, I think it's a very important, uh, uh, important conclusion, um, indicating that there is some kind of central process which goes across all tissues, at, at least at the epigenetic level. Uh, about the tissue specificity of line repression. It looks like lines are repressed in all tissues, because if you look uh, at adult organism, human, mouse, um, you will see that in adults, there are only two places in the body where, where you can find uh, in healthy tissues uh, transcription of lines. And this is uh, testes and uh, some neurons of brain, uh, both of them, by the way, behind immunological barrier. All other tissues are completely silent, indicating that these uh, hundreds of thousands of copies are under quite severe epigenetic repression. However, your question makes lots of sense because when a uh, tumor originates from different tissues, obviously this tumor carries the signs of epigenome of that particular tissue. And since tumors have a tendency to desilence retro elements, I wouldn't be surprised that certain copies of lines will have higher chance to be derepressed in tumors of certain kind versus others. This has not been studied because there is no good tool to do that, but I'm sure that within a few years we'll know the answer to this question. Thank you very much. Rod, did you have a question? Uh, no, I, um, I don't. I want to respect people's uh, time and Andre and, uh, for um, you know their participation, uh, James, do you have a final question? I I do, but just real quick. So you know, if you look at uh, you know genetically modified models of of longevity, you know, like for example with hy hypermorphic hypomorphic IGF pathway or hypermorphic alt autophagy, which do you where do you see interruption in this pathway? In other words, is it is it better suppression of the of the desilencing, or is it that the cells get cleared out better, for example, later on in life? I think there are plenty of ways how to make us die earlier. <laughs> and it's not necessarily needs to do it by accelerating the naturally occurring process. I'm afraid that many of uh, longevity, acceler accelerated longevity models are simply um, creating the situations when other factors then real, uh, really happening, uh, start playing the bigger role and call become the uh, cause of premature death. No, uh, Andre, yeah. I was actually referring to the opposite, where life extending models like oh, hypomorphic for IGF and hypermorphic for autophagy. Oh, uh, hypo, I see, I, I didn't yeah. hear you, sorry about that. So yes, this, this type of things are extremely interesting to analyze. Uh, definitely. And uh, uh, it would be really nice to see uh, whether uh, any of these processes could be uh, either slowed down or you better reach better um, clearance of these cells of this kind. However, I still I will come back to my wrong uh, understanding of your question in the beginning, because those models of accelerated aging, which we know, such as progeria or uh, cocaine syndrome or, or uh, Xeroderma uh, pigmentosum, all of them, all of them are based on accelerated levels of DNA damage, which definitely leads to epigenetic derepression of uh, retro elements, which is now proven. Yeah, very cool. Fantastic talk, Andre, and thanks for all the discussion. 
Rod, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much as usual, Andre. I think you just kind of blow everybody's head off. So uh, <laughs> keep so, up the good work and uh, hope to see you soon. So thank you. We, we hope to be with you at a reasonable time and maybe we'll visit you as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.